Hello, everyone. Welcome to Pensive Politics with Mr. Watson. I am indeed your host, as always, Christian Watson. And with me today, I have uh, a quiet and brilliant, if I might say, writer and uh, thinker, Mr. Sean Kamek, uh, who is a member of the Young Voices Program, as I am. And he is a graduate student at, uh, at, uh, at University of Chicago, I believe. And we'll be talking about a few uh, topics pertaining to the areas of postmodernism, a, a very interesting situation he got himself in quite recently and things of that sort. And so, uh, Sean, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm really, uh, I'm really happy to be here, bud. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so let's actually begin with this uh, workers' collective thing that happened. So why don't you inform everyone uh, the situation you got yourself in the ire of the uh, of the group that you attracted recently? Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, last month, um, some flyers started popping up around town. So I'm, I'm at the University of Chicago, and the University of Chicago is in a little neighborhood called Hyde Park. Um, and it's a cute little historic sort of um, enclave on the south side of, of Chicago. Uh, and some flyers started popping up over over the past month about um, a rent strike. Um, there was a group organizing uh, a rent strike starting April 1st. And I wrote a letter to the editor of the local our local newspaper, the Hyde Park Herald, um, expressing my sort of criticisms of it. Um, they they came off to me as um, somewhat revolutionary LARPers. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they were quite <laughs> opportunistic. They were quite... Oh, for, uh, wait, wait, wait. For, for, for folks who don't know, uh, why don't you define what LARPing is? Because there are folks out there who are like, oh, what's, sure. what's a LARP? <laughs> sure. LARPing is uh, live action role play. So you, you see like LARPers, um, <laughs> yeah. traditionally like they dress up in, you know, medieval, uh, you know, medieval gear and they pretend or to anime be, or anime gear, anime, anime gear. Too. And they, and they pretend, you know, fireball, fireball. And they, you know, pretend they're all, uh, you know, what they're <laughs> dressed up as. So this is how I characterize the, this, the, the organizers of this rent strike. Now the, my, my criticism of the rent strike was this because, um, it's it's a rough time in Chicago right now, you know. The governor essentially fired uh, swaths of of, of of workers in the state of Illinois. Um, a lot of places are getting closed down. A lot of people are losing their jobs, and some people are going to have a hard time paying rent. And this is a, a serious, tricky sort of situation. Um, but these rent strike organizers were arguing that this isn't basically the the, the case that they were making is that this isn't just about. Um, people not being able to afford rent. It is the idea that um, land, uh, being a landlord and having to pay rent is something immoral that they're trying to get rid of and they're, they're trying to sort of overthrow. Um, uh, you know, they were advocating for things like using eminent domain to seize vacant units and fill them up with uh, people who need housing, th- things, things of this nature. Um, so I was critical of them, wrote a letter to the editor about that, and um, they posted out my picture, and they posted, you know, some some stuff about me. Uh, I, I had I had upset them um, apparently, which is fine. I mean, that's that's par for the course. You know, that's par for the course. Indeed. And so, it's interesting because this line of thought about land, uh, uh, about land owning and renting, and so on and so forth, it goes back into a, 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 a entire cacophony of historical schools of thought, like the mutualist school of thought that think that the idea that you that, that, that someone else can sort of uh, like um, that, that you work for someone else or someone else can own your labor or whatever and, and their and their phraseology is is immoral and it's wrong and it's not efficient. Uh, or the more Marxist school of thought that thinks property itself is theft and which is an oxymoron by the way, and that the entire idea of ownership is nothing more than exploitation. And and so how exactly, when you first saw this sort of uh, this sort of ideological wizardry manifesting itself and in, in, into the public sphere with these people saying this nonsense, what what's the, what was the pro, what brought you to the conclusion that you just that you needed to write a letter to the editor? And did you imagine that you would have any sort of reaction to it? Well, I'll will start with this. So um, I, I think there are like particularly in University of Chicago, there's a history of you know you know Chicago is quite good. University of Chicago is quite good for having a lot of heterodox viewpoints, um, and, and that includes Friedman, Saul, all those folks. That's, that's quite true. And and you also have Marxists, and you have communists, and you have this sort of um, 
very pink underbelly in a lot of the student, uh, you know, the, the student body. And I, I, I'm fine with that. I, I really like having those people around to talk to them. I'm, I, I, I like talking to a wide range of different people with differing ideas. I'm happy with that. So, but there's always in, in you know, Hyde Park, there's been a sort of, um, th- there's, there's been that, far left sort of radical uh, vicissitudes and they've always been sort of rattling about Mm -hmm. uh, rattling on about you know their their revolution and policy things they want and it's i've mostly ignored it because it's a small group and you know they're they're in the minority and no one really takes them seriously there are some policies that are typically is yeah. It typically is a small group. Yeah. Um, and th- there's some policies that they're actually pushing through that I'm a little critical of. But um, it, regardless, I, I, there was a t- like I saw them on Twitter or something one, one evening, and I, I was having issues sleeping um, because it had kind of wound me up a little bit. And I was a little bit anno- annoyed with it um, because, I, I, you know, wow. they, they were being – I don't know. There's a certain level of dishonesty in, in it when it's like, because right. it, it, they're presenting it as though we're here to help people who can't afford rent. And if you can't afford rent and you can't pay rent, it's not a rent strike. You just can't afford rent. What they were advocating is people who could afford rent to not pay rent in solidarity with those who couldn't afford it um, for larger sort of political political goals. And that, right. of course, that's... That- that's equivocation, of course, as we as we know. Yeah, I, that is pure equivocation. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah. I found it a little annoying. Um, so I just I, I wrote a letter to the editor, and and off it went. Um, and I actually have a uh, I have a story to tell about this. Actually, this is um a little bit of a new thing that just uh, I found out. So in my letter to the editor, um, I talk about one of the organizers of the strike, and I I refer to him by name. I won't refer to him by name here because it's not neither here nor there, but I refer to him by name in the letter to the editor. Um, and I, you know, like I said, I kind of refer to him as a, as a Marxist, uh, you know, as a Marxist LARPer, as a political manipulative opportunist, yada, yada, yada. It's not the most charitable thing I've ever written, but Hey, what, what have you? Um, and I'm in class on Thursday in a, one of my zoom classes and I'm scrolling through the, the other people in the class and his name pops up in my class and his face is right oh, there in front dear. of me. And it's oh, like, my. It's like, well, you know, because he's a grad student <laughs> at UC. Um, and that's fine. Again, like, again, it's not, a, it's not an issue that, someone's, that someone thinks that. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about anything. But it was a, it was a fun little, well, yeah, that's, that's, that's him. That's it. That's, that's, that's his face. Right. That's, that's what I right. get for poking, at, poking the big red bear of Hyde Park. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh. I didn't know there were bears in Hyde Park. Yeah. That, that, that's uh, not just the that, that's bears, new to me. Baby. Uh, I'm going. I'm going to have to avoid that. Yeah, man. I don't like bears. Uh, <laughs> oh, Peter's going to come after me. Anyway, anyway. Uh, so I actually wanted to go a little bit back to the point you made earlier uh, about how about the equivocation they made between those who can who can afford to pay rent but don't want to, and those who can afford to pay pay rent and probably think that it's not their duty to pay rent even though they enter into a contract. And that's anyway. I wanted to do. I think this this connects. To the sort of uh, privilege, uh, the sort of privilege attitude that a lot of dialectical materialists, and as people who who who, who study Marxism knows that dialectical materialism is the sort of philosophical paradigm in which the Marxist conception uh, is birthed and is and is festooned through, is jettisoned through um, the academic literature. This is there's this idea that dialectical materialism gives you that essentially says that since you are a victim or you are a, a you, you are a party, so some offense that happened to you in a long line of offenses that connects to your group, i.e. in these in, in well, these people's uh, cases, the proletariat, those who are done, aren't as been have must benefit as um, the bourgeois do, do those who cannot necessarily stop their exploitation. Supposedly, this is all supposedly. Uh, that that means therefore you're connected to that legacy of oppression, and you have and you can stake a claim on that. So my question is this: We've seen this sort of idea um, advocated in American politics, and I think that it is quite superficially called identity politics or grievance politics, but it's deeper. It's deeper because those two things are very surface level in that they only address an aspect of that dialectical materialist system, whereas what these people are invoking completely and utterly throws the entire kitchen sink of what they claim to be a heritage to, i.e. The, the, uh, the, the oppression of being a part of this class at people. So how do you respond to that sort of claim that they are oppressed because they inherit a legacy of oppression that, that uh, they, enter to, they enter into 
either willingly or unwillingly. How do you how do you intellectually explain that, and how do you debunk that or or critique that, so to speak? Because for many people, it's very hard. Yeah. So but how do you handle it? Yeah. So the first thing to kind of do, and I, you know, I'm I'm not. Um, so the first thing to do is to sort of differentiate between classical Marxism and new Marxism because they're 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 very different right. things. And I and yeah, yeah, something I. Uh, I, I kind of want to avoid doing is just I, I don't I don't want to just be like a taxonomist of what people do. I'm not I don't it's not my goal just to kind of see their behavior and put them in a sort of with give them a philosophical lab, label and, and that be the end of the day. Um, but what people are doing today is they are well they're collectivists. I mean I, let's first and foremost they're collectivists in that they mm-hmm. their conceptualization of the self is not a sort of a, a, an individual view that they are not i but right. they are a, a a we they are a, they are an us mm-hmm. um and um and it's not just us mm-hmm. it, it's not just us right now and all the people who are like me now it's all the people who are like me now and were me across time so i know that that that, <laughs> that was a little bit um cumbersome to say but the, uh, their basic idea is this: it's that people, um, people, you know, an individual, insofar as they believe that, as they interact with individuals, um, their moral character is determined by the history of their ethnicity. Um, and what that means is that if you have a history of being oppressed, if your ethnic group or religious group um, or, or, or race, let's say, um, has a has a history of oppression then you are sort of, you know, words they use are like systematically oppressed, but it's, it's really you've, you've historically been oppressed and therefore you still are and people still sort of owe you something for that um, wrongdoing. And on the flip side of that, if your ancestors um, of your, either your ethnic group or religion or race um, were historically oppressors, then you should feel some sort of guilt for that. You are somewhat um, responsible for that. Um, and you know, that's not a new, that's not a particularly new conception. That's not a particularly new worldview. Um, absolutely not. Oh no, it's been around for ages. It's, it's a bad idea though. Um, and (laughs) and the reason it's a bad (laughs) idea is that if, if we're not individualists, if we don't accept that your belief, um, is distinct from you uh, and, and, people who look like you are different than you and you aren't responsible for what other people have done. If we don't accept that, then all that's really left is war. I mean, it's conflict. All all you can do is have group conflict. Um, And that, Hmm. and that's the history of humanity, unfortunately is, is, is Hmm. ethno collectivistic conflict. Um, And, Mm -hmm. you know, you can just look to any, I mean, well, Right. I'd say it's a bad idea for that reason, first and foremost, is because it, it, it predisposes, it disposes us when we have to solve problems. It, 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 it disposes the only way we can solve problems is um, through group conflict. And I think that's what a lot of the sort of new sort of collectivist types are positioning themselves. Um, and, and right. Doing. So this, this appears to be more of a, a sort of consequentialist critique as opposed to a more um, a critique of the of the other principle of what they're saying, although you are critiquing the principle of what they're saying through this consequentialist method. Um, my, my question would be because, like, theoretically, and this is part of the reason why I don't really give much stock to arguments that invoke the death rates of communist countries, because theoretically, if those, com- if those communist countries or less communist countries, whatever, uh, didn't have those death rates, uh, there would have to be something there that would still uh, call them, that would still um, satisfy that they are reprehensible regimes or their, their concept was not propitious to the to human flourishing and the activation of the spiritual nectar of natural freedom. So in a more principle-based way, in a more conceptual-based way, I suppose, what do you think is the problem with the idea that the time stream just moves, the, the time stream is continuously shooting out the, the effects of the past into our blood, into our veins, and causing us to experience these great ills. How do you counter that conceptually? Uh, I, so non-consequentially, I suppose you're saying? Yeah. So the, the, the deontologically, any, any sort of uh, way of that, like that, but like without consequence, without saying, okay, this produces this, this or bad. Because I find that's, that's fine if you're looking at, looking at it from a totally practical point of view. 
a totally practical, totally pragmatic point of view. But this is actually, I think, the thought of, of the pragmatic school. I think that you ha- that you have to do see things. You have to see things beyond their effects. Well, not you have just, to see how things. Yeah, and, and not just pra- yeah. not not just the, the reason I like to make consequentialist arguments. Um, though, though I don't, though I'm not a consequentialist necessarily, it, that's not, I don't build my own belief system consequentially. But the reason I make consequentialist critiques is because consequentialist critiques are usually grounded in actual real world, you know, concretes. And when you're just talking to someone and you're trying to explain why that's bad, that's a really good place to find common ground. You know, I, I don't need to have necessarily a metaphysical dispute or an epistemological dispute with a Marxist to make the case why Marxism is bad. It's actually, it's actually much more, it, it's much easier to convince someone when you just look at the applied real world concretes, uh, the, the outcome mm-hmm. of that sort of, you know, ideological, uh, that sort of ideology. Sure. Certainly, certainly, consequentialism certainly does have its have its place, but 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 to just play it out a little bit, a little bit, just to sure. counter that, um, the, the the Marxist, I suppose, uh, who is more, I suppose, um, conceptually rooted, right? Some of the, like some of these theoretical economic e- economist Marxists out there in academia right now, uh, they may very well look at those circumstances and uh, add an argument or someone or a disqualifying principle to try to root Marxism. From being indictable by those circumstances, and so, uh, and that may be fallacious. That may not be fallacious. I mean, it depends on on the kind of arguments they're using, of course. But I I, I find that it's very easy for a Marxist, especially especially a dyed in the wool Marxist, to retreat within the confines of their presuppositions and use those to disqualify the few instances in which Marxism or communism, when it was put into effect, had uh, materially material ills. And it's simply uh, keep on keep holding on to the aspiration, right? This is precisely what Bernie Sanders did when he uh, said that that Cuba has a good healthcare system. It's not it's not about the effects of what of what Castro did. It's not about the, the people he exiled or killed. It's not about the state controlled media in Cuba. It's not about the fact that they are still driving 1960s cars. It's not about any of that. It's about the I, the aspiration. And so I think that if you hit them on the aspirational realm, the aspirational point. Even if it doesn't make them budge, it will at least make them have to, if they're intellectually honest, reconsider their preconceptions. Do you see my, my point? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, uh, assuming assuming intellectual honesty, as we sh- should, um, uh, uh, assuming, that, assuming that someone's not just, doing, not just taking it dogmatically, which is often the case. Yeah, you can make a sort right. of, like w- one of the critiques that I, I sort of levy, and this comes from you know, some classical liberals is, you know, the, I, I, I suppose it actually does keep, it goes back to a consequentialist argument. Maybe, maybe I'm somewhat stuck in that is just the outcomes of collectivistic of the collectivistic ethic. And the fact that, mm-hmm. you know, what the collectivistic ethic means is that people are going to be sacrificed. I mean, the, the here, here's, here's the thing. The collectivistic ethic is human sacrifice. Because you're sacrificing oh, people for something, some sort of greater good fantasy. And yes. when I'm trying to, Precisely. You know, and, and again, when I'm just talking to someone and trying to make a make, cr- cr- critique what they think, first off, we have to distinguish who we're actually talking to. Are we talking to a classical Precisely, Marxist yeah. or are we talking to a sort of new postmodern type Marxist? Because you have to approach this yeah. thing very, very uh, differently. Uh, yeah. I much prefer talking to yeah. classical Marxists because they're actually, so they are... Yep. I'm familiar with materialism. They're pretty objective. They're just incorrect logically. Um, and that's fine. Right, and, right. and that's fine. Um, when you have to talk to sort of postmodern Marxists, uh, yeah, when you have to start talk to a postmodern Marxist, you, you, uh, and is you approach everywhere. it a little bit differently. <laughs> and there's also this, this idea, yeah. and, and there's a sort of criticism that comes quite a bit, is that postmodern Marxism is a you know it it that e- even that word is incoherent because you can't have something that is both is. postmodern and marxist but i i kind of disagree with that and I, I, I this is something i was interested in talking to you about and see see what you think is that so stephen stephen yeah. hicks um and my, my argument is kind of coming yes. from stephen hicks's some of his work on postmodernism um 
the, the basic idea is this, is that postmodernism is not an end in itself, it is a means to an end. And I, I actually think that postmodernism is rational when you look at it as an inst- you look at it instrumentally. So postmodernism is an instrumental strategy for a political end. Right, so it's basically strategic incoherence to achieve a political end, and the political end is usually some sort of far left um, Marxist style politic. And, and one of the ways we know this, and this is Stephen Hicks' work, is that almost all postmodernists mm-hmm. on a very narrow the the, the sort of postmodern um, like philosophers, not necessarily just your average postmodernists, they are all on a very right. narrow band on the far left. And if we were actually true postmodernists, you would expect that um, you would have postmodern monarchists, postmodern, more postmodern libertarians, postmodern anarchists, postmodern, you know, fascists. But you don't. You have postmodernists all on a very narrow band on the far left. And I think part of the reason this is, as I've said, is that postmodernism is a strategy is a strategy of incoherence, but it is rational because it is a means to a political end. Hmm. Hmm. Well, so I think there's a lot of ways. There's there's a lot of directions you can go with that argument. Uh, so I, I I will freely admit I have not I have not entirely read Mr. Hicks' work. Although I think that I think that from the bit I, I the extras I have the extras I have seen I think that he is a, a brilliant scholar on these things. And I I've met him a few times. He's just absolutely he has lucid thinking about these things. He hits, he always hits straight to the center. I think that he's a phenomenal ac- ac- academic academician a professor whatever. Um. Having said that, about this particular argument, I think that we should understand – so before we can really define the nature of things, we must, we must first understand the angles upon which we approach them. And the angle upon which I think folks who study postmodernism approach them are probably folks who are not necessarily in the postmodern tradition or uh, folks who are simply trying to examine it from a perspective that makes sense to them, i.e. objectively. Uh, the, the the problem with this approach is, I think, um, that e- even within postmodernism, the idea of strategies, if you're if you're more of a Foucauldian, would would, would simply be a, a, a tool of, of of power dynamics uh, used by those who have a higher upper hand in, in the in the sort of struggle for power against those who don't have the resources or ability to uh, strategize the the marginalized, so to speak. And so even the kind of terms that we use to try to un- conceptualize, understand postmodernism would be to some some postmodernists. Again, it's very hard to say this universally because they're not really principally uh, consistent. Uh, would, would, would be, in fact, tools of oppression uh, that are used to, uh, to to further certain aims. So I, I, I think that the angle in which we approach postmodernism, we have to be very careful to make sure that angle is uh, not necessarily in line with the postmodern uh, doctrine. Uh, but that it strives to understand the underlying essence of its thinking. You get what I'm saying? Uh, because you, you can't really approach postmodernism, at least try to understand its instrumentality in a purely objective fashion. You have to be willing to wade into the dragon's uh, dragon's belly and see what's in there before you take the lance and you cut it off and you let the thing come, let, let the stuff pour out. That's one thing. And I'll, I'll let you respond in a moment. And the other thing, uh, I also think that a lot of postmodernists uh, would, again, this, is, this entirely depends on who we're talking about. If we're talking about Sartre here, uh, <laughs> then, then uh, there is no political strategy. According to Sartre, the past does not exist. Today is ever evolving. All this kind of stuff he said in the, in the, in the novel Nausea. According to him, uh, there is there is no there is no morality. There is no past. History is a figment of our of our collective imagination. Things like that. Um, if you talk about someone who's like Marcuse, who is a part of the Frankfurt School, I believe, then I suppose there may have been a strategy. So I don't I don't know. I think that we have to be very careful in making broad prescriptions because a lot of the postmodernists themselves didn't even see themselves as postmodernists. That's kind of a term we've attached to them given their period of time and their rejection of the principles of modernity. So. In, in, in conclusion, I just think that we should be very careful, very delicate uh, with, when approaching these things uh, with our own lenses. Because I think that um, seeing things, as Roger Scruton said, the late Roger Scruton, great Roger Scruton said, seeing things through the eye of, the, of another can really, really help root our understanding in reality. What do you think? Yeah, I, no, of course. I, I think 
you know, Scruton's right on the point with, with that. Um, you know, there's a distinction between talking about like, you know, postmodern, big postmodern thinkers, um, and your nitty gritty postmodernists in a social science or humanities department at a university. Um, well, and of course, I, yeah. in, in sort of a more, um, sort of paradoxical way, I, I think people, you know, like Foucault are slightly more principled postmodernists, right? They're, because they, 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 um, in a sense, yeah. yeah. Foucault, Foucault better than the other yeah. ones, yeah. Foucault definitely better. But I mean, when you, the panopticon is actually coherent and things, things of that, yeah. that discipline and punishment, all that kind of stuff is actually coherent. Yeah, some, Thesis yeah, and things yeah. like that. And, um, you know, the medicalization of mental illness and all, all of that stuff for sure. Sure. Um, but like, let me let me give you an example because uh, this is a this kind of interaction is something that I have uh, frequently, um, and it always strikes me as funny. And and this is I, I think will help illustrate what I mean when I say strategic um, strategic incoherence or strategic right. inconsistency. And it's basically this. So I, I let's say I'm in a class and this has happened. And I for for example, I'm in a class and we're talking about. Um, marriage or, or uh, I think we're talking about and I basically make an argument about um, pair bonding and how you know pair bonding came about about a, about a quarter of a million years ago in um, you know early homo that's when we first started you know male and female started pair bonding and investing in, in offspring and I basically made the case that you know marriage kind of comes out of out of this and it's evolutionarily strategic to do so um, and someone in the class objects and he says well, um, he says, he basically objects to the fact that I'm making a argument from human nature. And then in the next sentence, <laughs> and then in the next sentence, oh, which is fair. I mean, that's a, fi- you can make that critique. Actually, no arguments from nature. Yeah, you can right, make correct, that critique. Correct, yes. But then what he says, but we understand what his conclusion no, is. But yeah. In the next sentence, he says, because bonobos are polyamorous. So to w- what that means is that he's, he's, in the first part of the sentence, critiqued an argument from nature. He's critiqued the idea of arguing about human from a position of human nature, and then invoked an argument from nature of a non-human primate. Right. So he's in one hand mm-hmm. critiqued a sort of biological essentialist argument, and then used that argument to further his political end. Right. So we might yes. look at that and say that's incoherent. Right, but it's strategically incoherent right. because it always serves their okay. political end. Here's another example. You see the same thing with rational choice, rational choice theory. I, I, I know a lot of like sociologists here who are very critical of rational choice theory because it's far too um, individualistic and atomistic, and it's it's humans aren't rational and humans don't make choices and yada yada yada. The normal rational choice critiques, but if the rational choice argument serves their political end, which it often does, sometimes does, they will use the rational choice argument. They will accept the rational choice argument, even though they'll reject it when the rational choice argument doesn't serve their political end. Now, this is just another example of strategic, it looks incoherent, but it's not. It's a rational application of incoherence to serve their end. So that's what I mean when I say, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, strategic postmodernism. Yes, so 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 you're you're referencing the 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 sort of methods employed by the postmodern shock jocks, foot soldiers, Jack as I like to call them, within academia. The more the students in the press, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not trying to be uncharitable towards these these fine souls. I'm sure there are plenty of postmodernists, friends of mine, including that are very nice people, fine lives and everything, very very fine people. Not trying to be uncharitable, but they're foot soldiers of a, of a certain kind of uh, agenda. I would agree with that. Um, but again, as, as you mentioned before, there is a a, a, a gulf, a, a chasm, a, a void, so to speak, between the postmodernist thinkers like Sartre, Marcuse, uh, you know, um, Foucault, and the people who take their works and try to use them to sow nonsense and, and discord to the public discord or try to uh, sort of usurp it. Um, so I'll share an experience of my own. I was for a very, for a very um, brief, not not brief, but a very sustained period of time involved in collegiate debate. And in collegiate debate, uh, basically all of the arguments made in collegiate debate primarily have to do with some vestige of postmodernism or the postmodern techniques are employed. So things, so uh, terms like erasure, mm. which is a, 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 a or 
or uh, anthropomorph centrism, which was a a construct of of of, of Foucault. Positionality, exactly. Right? Or, uh, position, positionality. Oh yeah, all these very weird neologisms. Uh, I mean, these postmodernists they have more neologisms than than uh, uh, than Heidegger did, and, and he literally had a l- l- lexicon which you had to go through to understand his neologisms. Uh, uh, they would throw all these things at you, and if you have, if you tried to push back against it, they would critique you as as falling into as as as, as going into some sort of oppression oppression metric, trying to erase them, trying to psychically destroy them. All these things go back to oppression theory and Foucault and all this kind of stuff. This one guy actually invoked the, the Panopka argument. I was arguing for individual liberty, and he said, so the liberty that you think of, Christian, he said my name, he pointed at me, the liberty you think of is actually a panopticon of oppression around you, and you think it's liberty. This is a really clever, clever argument. You think it's liberty because you can see yourself in that prison, but you can't see yourself outside of it because it's a construct created by colonialistic you know, mind, mind masters, that's the word he used, to imprison you. I'm thinking to myself, Marxist, yeah. you are using you're, you're using rhetoric quite cleverly. And if you read the Panopticon, uh, the, the, Panopt- the part of uh, Foucault's works, you'll actually see Foucault did say something of that sort. And if you actually take it to his logical extreme, you could argue that. The problem is, it's not logical. <laughs> it's, it's essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixture of equivocation and rhetorical wizardry to create a, 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 a statement that, it, that in a syllogistic format does not logically follow. And so I, I've come against these kind of arguments. And whenever, after these debates, I would go up to them, I said, well, well look, look, do you actually believe in what you're saying? He said, well, belief is an illusion. I'm like, okay, okay. Do you actually think, he said, primarily, I'm doing this because it is the way that the collegiate debate space works. And overall, I think, I think that's correct. It's seeped into it so, so deep. And I've talked about this with Michael Marino, the guy who got disqualified from his high school debate round for quoting Benjamin for, uh, not Benjamin, <laughs> Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, and then got dis- disqualified out of his current university debate program for refusing to say that space is an illusion created by white folks. <laughs> uh, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's absolutely asinine. <laughs> so I have seen the effects of postmodernism in academia. And you're right, there is a certain strategy these people employ to advance a certain cause. But let's think about the thinkers. Do you think the thinkers themselves, particularly the ones that didn't really have any sort of uh, rooted philosophical, uh, well, rooted um, mechanistic uh, methods like like uh, Sartre, do you think that they really had an agenda or saw themselves as postmodernists or did they see themselves as sort of prophets of, of, of their minds and their contents? Well, what do you think? Do, when you when you ask the question, do they actually have an agenda? Here's what we you have to reckon with, and this is again coming from Stephen Hicks' work. What you have to reckon with is that all of these big thinkers are on a narrow band on the politically far left, and if they are actually postmodernists, you would not expect that to be the case. You would expect them to be more uh, more randomly distributed over political dispositions. Like I said, you'd have postmodern monarchists, mm-hmm. postmodern fascists, postmodern conservatives. Precisely. But you don't. You have they're all postmodernists on the very narrow band on the far left. So when you ask the question, you know, do they have an agenda? I I think it speaks for itself. They're clearly, I think, I think clearly. Um now, when we, we you're, I'm certain that yeah. you're talking about, um, we're we're talking about because I think this is something we're kind of running around is how do you how do you talk to people who talk like the people in your collegiate debate program? Um, and there's two ways to do it. You can try and out incoherent them, which is not which is a terrible thing to do because that's how they got themselves in that position in the first place. And because I, I see this in academia in, in, in a lot of the, in some of the departments here, um, unfortunately, particularly Mm -hmm. a lot in the sociology department here. Um, uh, there's this sort of, it's this increasingly verbose jargon and increasingly verbose lexicon. And they're almost just trying to like outdo one another with more and more complications. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's actually a word I've seen in some research, which, which struck me when I first started seeing, seeing it. They say that like the goal of this research is to complicate X sort of topic. Um, and yeah. you get this arms race of incoherence between within postmodernism and within this sort of 
postmodern tradition. Um, I don't want to be incoherent. I want to be clear, and I want to, and I, I think you can be far more devastating on maybe maybe not in a on, on a debate stage because that's a slightly different kind of engagement. But when you're just talking to someone, you can be far more dedicated, uh, devastating, and far more insightful with very simple uh, phrases, very simple, a very simply worded investigation of their ideas and of the logic within them, because people are sort of constructing, you know, they can say they're postmodernists and they can have this big sort of, you know, this massive dictionary that they draw from to sort of, you know, as a smoke screen or what have you, but there are, they do recognize the logic of these ideas. And if you can point out where those ideas are flawed and what those ideas lead to, again, this is my sort of consequentialist leaning, um, you can get a lot further doing it that way. And that, that's what I, that's what I try and do anyways. Um, yeah. Right. So, so, so look, I, I, let me be, let me be, uh, maybe be charitable towards my friend. I don't consequentialism by itself I, 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 so I think the biggest error of, of, of philosophy throughout its history has been that philosophers or either either contemporary ones, more most likely contemporary ones, contemporary philosophers have divided themselves, have divided um, other philosophers into classes. These sort of um, uh, early modern philosophy, rationalism versus empiricism, you know, the platonic, the, the, the platonic struggles and so on and so forth, uh, all, all that, all that kind of stuff. Does a disservice to actual knowledge production, right? It's it's as, as as Plato says, right? When there's when there's severe disagreement, there must be ignorance because there is a, there's certainly a, a a objective truth somewhere up there in the realm of the forms or, or, or somewhere out in the universe, so to so to speak. And so uh, I I don't uh, I say this to this I I don't try to partition uh, the line of usefulness between consequentialism, deontology, virtue ethics. I think that I think that. A variety of ethical schools of thought and methodologies can be accurately and propitiously used, dispensed with, to further the cause of individual liberty and the understanding of the alchemy of human freedom. I absolutely and consequentialism in this modern world, in which our minds are so primed to numbers and statistics, like the like like, like, the, like the sort of god forms or god tools. No matter how much that pains me and irks me and makes me just want to go and curl into a ball and transform into I don't know like sort of this or elemental being of of, of wisdom. As much as it. I still recognize the world is like that. Most argument programs, most debate programs will emphasize the use of statistics. It's kind of the world's perceptions have been kind of shifted and, and changed uh, by this sort of uh, focus on the, on the sort of empirical side. But the empirical side and the rational side are absolutely indispensable to truly understanding, forget human freedom, the general truth. So I think consequentialism can work in tandem with the ontology. Uh, if you know how to use them, I think that if you're going to be at all, if you're at all going to be effective and even consistent, you're going to have to factor in a consequentialist methodology with a deontological soil, right? So, uh, sort of, uh, let, let, let's suppose that watering the plants uh, is the methodology, uh, but uh, the soil in which they sprout from is the day is the sort of principled concrete rock basis and if you change the soil all the time the plants will die but if you change the kind of water you use as long as you're still using water the plants will live that's how i like to think of deontology and consequentialism uh and i and and uh on to your point about the postmodernist how to um, sort of talk to them that's right if you just talk to them in very simple language or whether it be in a public forum or in a personal conversation i think that you will get much further than they do uh even if you don't convince them, not just, you will yeah, still not, have not just it. further than they do. I, I want to, uh, you know, well, first off, my goal is not to change someone's mind. That my, my that's not really my approach. Right. Even if you don't convince my, them, my approach is you will have gotten further. Right. You will, you will have gotten further. I, I meant to Go finish. Ahead. You will have gotten further in the pursuit of truth than they have. Yeah. I think that that's a pretty. Uh, I, what do you think about well, that? My approach to these things, like I, I'm not, it's my goal as, you know, when, when I, when I talk to people, when I do social science, it's, it's just my goal to understand people. 
that's first and foremost, my goal is to mm-hmm. understand what people think, what they believe, and why they do that. Um, subjectively, right. you know, in, in their own terms, in their own culture, you know, how does this hang together for them? Um, mm-hmm. And it's well, while I would prefer more people to be individualists and more people to be, you know, true like classical liberals, or libertarians, I, I um, that's never my goal when I approach someone. When I approach someone, particularly postmodernists, I, I just, I just want to kind of understand them, see how it hangs together. And if, if I'm up for a bit of fun, sort of start poking at it and, and simply seeing where sh- it more like showing them where the holes are in this way of thinking and way of talking. Right. Um, yeah. Right. But, but primarily my goal is just to understand them. That's always, that's always my goal when I right. talk to people is just to understand them. Right. Uh, yeah, so when I say further, I don't mean in a sort of proselytizing or evangelizing sense. I'm not sure it's the the goal of of, of libertarians or individualists to evangelize uh, their uh, their beliefs to folks in an attempt to convert them. I think that actually runs counter to individualism. Actually, I think that if we are caught into conversation, humble conversation, good conversation, hard conversation, it is therefore our goal to be honest to that and to stand firmly in the in in, in the truth. Uh, but it is not our. It, but it's not. I don't think it's our goal to just go out and begin converting people. So I, I wasn't trying to at all insinuate that. I think that that people who do do that, um, people the the, the the Caitlin Bennett's of the world and people <laughs> like that, um, uh, you know, the the agitators of the world, the the change my minds of the world, that kind of stuff. Man, that's a, that's an entirely different episode. But that's just not that's, that's not propitious. I think to actually understanding, as you said, the understanding the eye, as Roger Scruton would say, and then as as a as Plato would say, really getting to the, the source, and I'm paraphrasing him, of course, the source of the truth, which is my ultimate goal. Yeah, um, and I, I think so, I, I, yeah, I might sound like a bit of a, um, I might honestly sound like a bit of a subjectivist next to you, maybe. Um, but I think, I not think at all. there are, not at all. there are, and, and I'm not a moral relativist, but there are, let's call them moral languages, different moral universes that different cultures live in different people live within we can uh, you know you can call them there's some work done on this by a by my advisor um like the ethic of autonomy and ethic of community ethics of divinity these are all different sort of moral ways of looking at at reality and looking at society um Mm -hmm. and i don't i think you can have you can have certain universals without having a degree any sort of like too much uniformity. And as you point out, if we're true liberals, uh, we sort of have to be tolerant of um, illiberal practices even. And to be true sort of, you know, open-minded people, we need to be tolerant of, you know, incoherent postmodern gibberish um, and understand the sort of person and, and, and the person underneath it and why they think those things that they do. And just to kind of understand them, I suppose, is my, my approach. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I think that's that is that is very important. And uh, uh, so I, I, I typically take an eclectic approach when it comes to my my worldview. And so I, uh, while my basis is certainly individual rights, I like to draw from a lot of different cultures, a lot of different cultural foundations, which have their own sort of flavor and their own sort of uh, uh, metaphysical uh, fervor to the idea of the truth, to the idea of of acceptability, of autonomy, and so on and so forth. You know, I I draw from, I draw from the Taoist school, from the Confucian school. I, I, I I draw from a lot of different, different schools. I draw from, um, you know, the, 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 the new, the, the new age, which is often maligned, uh, particularly, um, the, the theosophy and all that kind of stuff. In some instances, in the sort of instances of spirituality, or what theosophy became, I don't actually subscribe to theosophy as Blavatsky did it. Crazy stuff. No, but as it, what it became, what it, what it came into during the 70s and 80s, that kind of stuff. I, I, I draw from a lot of different things. And of course, those are very different schools. I mean, you go to Confucius. Confucius is like, you know, society and, 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 and traditional uh, traditional homage is very important. Whereas the, the, the sort of new age person, the more spiritualist will say, no, finding homage in, 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 in society within the kingdom of yourself and expanding that into ascension beyond the atmosphere is what's important. But still, I do think that these the ideas can work in tandem and they can indeed reveal universals to us that we've otherwise not have seen. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I don't think, and you know, my, what I sort of work in is less philosophy and more like 
cultural psychology and, and more anthropological stuff. So I, I, I'm talking more, what I'm more interested in is sort of philosophical ideas and how those manifest in, in certain communities and ways of, ways of living, Absolutely. ways of being. Yeah. Um, but there are different worldviews and different sort of cultural and moral ideas that are incompatible, Absolutely, yeah. incompatible entirely. And there is no middle ground between them. Let me give you for an example. If you want to take, you know, American autonomous individualism versus fundamentalist Islam, those two things are fundamentally incompatible, right? So how do we, as liberals, libertarians, liberal pluralists, if we want to be liberal pluralists, and which I think we should be liberal pluralists, how do we sort of approach a a uh, a society that has within it so many different enclaves of fundamentally mm-hmm. juxtaposed ideas, religions, and cultures. Now, I think I think there is a solution here, but that is a that's a question that we have to come come on because there's also there's always this sort of like soft imperialism of liberalism, which is where like no no we we love everyone so long as you believe in individual rights and autonomy and so so long as you're not a uh, you know so so long as you you're not a, a polygamist and so long as you let gays get married and so long as you have abortion rights you know yada 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 there's this sort of right. it's soft liberal sort imperialism. Of alter- the altar of assimilation, as I call it, and it's high priests and high priestesses. Yeah. Um, so how do we how, how do how do we deal with that? Well, you know, I think there's an answer, but I think that's it's more important to have that as a question at the moment. No, I, yeah, I think that any philosopher would tell any 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 philosophy professor who is worth his salt or her salt would tell you that the question is probably more important than the answer at the at the onset, in my opinion. Um, and so that. Will be a question that I hope to tackle with you in the future, my friend. Thank uh, okay, you so much, thanks, Christian. I appreciate for, it. <laughs> thank you so much for showing up. I appreciate it, and thank you everyone for listening. I hope to see all of you soon in the next episode. Bye bye.